I spend a lot of time looking at the weather. What do I look for? How to make my determination on when I leave and when to stay at the dock. In this video, I'm going to go over how I predict weather. I'm going to go over all the apps and stuff that I use and the uh, factors I use in determining um, when we're going to leave. What weather apps do you use for weather? Please leave them in the comment section below. Close your eyes, hear the voice within. How I determine when I take the boat out depends on a combination of the following factors. So first off, uh, three days or less uh, is all I look for a forecast. Anything further out than three days uh, is pure speculation. Uh, wind is generally all I care about with my predictions. The wind brings the waves. Right? So I look at the wind speed and the direction. I look at the wind gusts. I really want them to be less than 15 knots for the gusts. The sea state prediction, which I really want to see one foot or less, and the tide direction and the time that the tide turns. Um, the tide and the wind should be going the same direction. Now, if the wind's light enough, you know, if you're talking five or ten knots of wind, then the tide direction won't matter as much. But the faster the wind's blowing, the more important that tide matters. And if you're in an area of water that has a lot of current, then the, the wind actually um, significantly matters with that as well. So you always want the wind and the tide to go in the same direction. Um, I look at the morning and the afternoon for the areas that I'll be traveling through. Uh, generally speaking, early morning is better, but not always. Uh, I usually target 10 knots or less of wind speed, which includes the gusts with a zero sea state. That'll give me nearly flat seas. Uh, five knots of wind would be nearly glossy flat seas. Uh, wind gusts larger than 15 knots will have me seriously considering staying at the dock. At the dock. Anything over 20 knots, and I'm not going anywhere. Um, I would never venture out into a predicted three-foot sea state. What if it was wrong? I'd rather go out into a one-foot sea state prediction and then find myself in three to four-foot seas than a predicted three-foot sea state that ended up being wrong and find myself in six-footers. So I use uh, three main apps for wind forecast, Windy, Marine Weather Forecast, and Buoy Weather. Uh, Windy uh, Premium, I pay for it. It's 20 bucks a year. It lets me easily look several hours or a few days ahead and easily lets me pick the area that I plan to be boating in. It shows me the wind speed and the direction, the gusts, and the sea state predictions. Uh, buoy Weather is my second opinion app. It's 95 bucks a year, a bit more spend, spendy, but I reference it as a second check to the wind forecast above and to get whether um, it'll be sunny or rainy outside and the daily temperatures. For the most part, though, wind is really all I care about because the wind brings the waves and bad seas um, are never fun. Marine Weather Forecast Pro um, is five bucks a year. It's really inexpensive. Um, and it gives me the small craft advisory alerts on my phone. Um, it also gives me the marine weather forecast too, which I like. So a small craft advisory, um, you know, what's a small craft? What's the definition of a small craft? Technically, there isn't a definition of a small craft. Um, they leave it totally up to you to decide if your boat is a small craft. A small craft advisory is called when wind speeds are sustained between 20 and 33 knots usually, and a gale warning is 34 to 47 knots. Um, I specifically monitor alerts of the following areas in the Puget Sound and San Juans. These come to my phone via notifications. The San Juan Islands, Puget Sound, Admiralty Inlet, and then the east entrance of Straits of Juan de Fuca. The east entrance of the Straits of Juan de Fuca is what I pay the most attention to. Big waves are possible here. The weather around the San Juan Islands and Puget Sound is directly affected by the east entrance Straits of Juan de Fuca in my experience. Though I will say that I have been halibut fishing in flat, glossy seas in the middle of the east entrance Strait of Juan de Fuca, right on top of uh, Eastern Bank, actually. And I decided to come home via Admiralty Inlet, and I found myself in two to three foot seas. It doesn't always work out, out that way, which you, the way you would think. Um, I also consider channel surfing to be a small craft. If for no other reason, I'm a recreational boater, and big seas just aren't fun. So I do have a Garmin GXM54 weather antenna installed on channel surfing. I found that the only subscription that makes sense for it is the SiriusXM Marine Coastal. This is the zero to three hour advanced forecast. 
The other weather apps are far better for tomorrow and the next day forecasts, but I do like that it integrates on the chart plotter and overlays weather on the charts. I primarily use it for seeing the wind direction when I'm actually driving the boat. It helps me determine if I'm in chop, maybe running the other side of the channel would provide more wind protection. In Southeast Alaska, the GXM54 actually wasn't all that useful. Most of the time it struggled to get a satellite signal with the mountains that were uh, really tall all around us. Uh, as well, XM radio also struggled um, to get music for the same reasons. For tides and current prediction, I use an app called iTides. What I like about iTides is that it lets me walk the sine wave of the current um, speed predictions. I use this for Deception Pass all the time. I will comfortably go through Deception Pass as long as the current is four knots or less in either direction. Now, I need good weather in Rosario Strait, obviously, because that's where I'm usually heading out into or coming in from uh, to go through Deception. But being able to identify the time slot where Deception is at four knots or less usually gives me a several hour window to cross. Most tide and current apps I've found generally only tell you the times of slack. There are days where Deception Pass doesn't peak above four knots, in which case the gate is open all day for me. It's also important to note that slack doesn't always occur at high tide and low tide. There are designated tide and current stations and they are separate. Oftentimes high and low tide do align with slack, but not always. Petersburg, Alaska has three current stations and two tide stations out in front of the marina. Deception Pass has a current station with a tide station on the east and west side. So here's what happens, and I'll use Deception Pass as an example. Um, as the tide comes in from the ocean, it travels down the Straits of Juan de Fuca. All that water rushes into Deception Pass, which is a choke point. This causes the water to have to speed up to get through that narrow channel. But even as the water speeds up, it's still not enough to balance the water between the east and west sides of the pass. The tide continues to rise faster than the water can get through Deception Pass. This creates a back pressure of water as it's funneled through Deception Pass. The tide will eventually get to high tide, but the east side of Deception Pass and the west side will each be at different levels of water, which creates back pressure. Now, Deception Pass won't actually hit slack water until the east and west side waters levels um, balance out. This won't occur until the tide turns and goes the other direction. This is why it's very important to reference current tables and not tide tables when predicting slack water through Deception Pass and other narrow passageways. Looking at this example, the west side of Deception Pass has a water height of 3.6 feet, while the east side is at 2.7 foot. The resulting difference is what causes the 4.7 knots of current. Seymour Narrows, Dent Rapids, Yakulta Rapids, Greenpoint Rapids, to name a few, all experience this. Because of this, I always consider current and tide to be separate, and I always reference them separate. Unfortunately, iTides is only available on Apple iPhones and iPads. For Android devices, I'd recommend using DeepZoom.com. It's a website that will give you the same information as iTides and lets you walk the sine wave to determine the current. It also easily identifies the current stations from the tide stations. I don't use my Garmin chart plotter for tide and current predictions, mainly because when I'm looking at this data, I'm looking at it at home several days in advance of my trip and I'm not on the boat. However, even on the boat, the chart plotter interface makes it too time consuming to look at a current station of where I'm going to be at a later date and time. iTides and Deep Zoom um, both make that really easy to plan. I also installed a barometer on the boat. A uh, normal barometric pressure is 29.8 to 30.2 inches of mercury that's steady weather if it goes if the pressure goes above 30.2 it means clear skies and calm weather if it starts to fall below 29.8 the weather is getting worse um, this helps a lot when lt and cellular service isn't readily available right and the internet may be maybe sketchy for you with where with where you're located we use this a lot actually in southeast alaska um, as a way to keep track of the weather even the best uh, predictions can end up wrong way wrong after all, they are only just predictions. So we got caught up in some bad weather on our Southeast Alaska trip. Check out this video of what bad weather looks like and see how the Ranger Tug R27 outboards handle the bad weather. If you enjoyed watching this video, click the screen to watch another.